right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ascend. We're very excited that you're here with us this morning. Uh, it's a special day. It's Father's Day. Jason's got a great message for us. How many of you were here for the Mother's Day message? I know the ladies were a big fan, getting their, getting their husbands, getting their men lined out, <laughs> doing what they need to do. Um, but we're very excited. It's a very special day, Father's Day. Is, uh, is just very significant to us as believers just because of who God is to us and who he is as a father transforms our lives in such a significant way. So we just want to welcome you this morning and, and I just want to invite you to pray with me and we just want to just offer up our thanks to God and ask him to be present in this room with us as we lift our voices in worship and in praise to his name. And I just want to encourage you that we, we just begin to develop an expectation for his presence and for who he is in this room. A lot of times it's easy to get caught in letting the worship team do all the work in terms of, you know, bringing our praises to the Lord. And, to, and then you all of a sudden you feel like that, that um, freedom in the room to, to start engaging your heart in worship and in prayer. And sometimes it takes them, you know, half the, half the set to help get us there, to help prepare our hearts for worship. And I just want to encourage you, that it's not their job to, 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 to prepare our hearts, it's our job to prepare our hearts. It's their job to help lead us into, into the throne room to give God all the praise and all the worship and all the glory. Amen? So, let's not be spectators this morning, let's be participants in worship, right? So let's just pray. I just want to encourage you to, to engage your heart, um, get your spirit man going, and, and let's just give God what he deserves this morning, because he is worthy of it all. So, Father, we thank you for, for who you are and for what you've done in our lives. And we just want to come this morning in response to your goodness and just speak out thanksgiving to you and speak out our praise and give you all of our worship, God. You've lavished your goodness upon our lives, and we just want to respond in kind and say, you are good. You are our God. We are your people, and we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. So we praise you, God. And Holy Spirit, would you fill this room just as Jesus promised that you would come and lead us into all truth and that you join our hearts together in unity and we'd bring our praise to Abba, Father, that that would happen in this room this morning. So we give you praise, God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, let's all stand together and just really press in. I just really felt this morning, I just really wanted to um, praise the Father for his goodness, how he's such a good father, for his faithfulness, for his love. And so um, I really need your help this morning. I got about 30 minutes of sleep, and I had two very intense gigs yesterday, so my voice is very tired. So please sing loud at the top of your lungs if you can to uh, help me out a little this morning and um, if you don't know these songs just really press in and say the words as a prayer and, and just sing out to the Lord and let's just really celebrate our Father in Heaven <laughs>
Father's Day. And I have a Father. Sing it to Him. He calls me His own. He'll never leave me. No matter where I go. Sing it to Him. I have a Father.
preacher's crying now. Day and night, night and day. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God See the lightning, I can feel the thunder, I can hear the voices proceeding from your throne. I can see the lightning, I can feel the thunder, I can hear the voices proceeding from your throne. 24 hours. Just crying now, day and night, night and day. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty.
God, you're so good. You're so good, God. You are worthy. Just lift up your voice just one more minute and just proclaim God's goodness back to him. God, you are a good God. And we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. You are so good over our lives, God. And this morning we worship you. We thank you, Father, for who you are. You're such a good God. We lift up the name Jesus in this place this morning. There is no name above the name Jesus. And you have exalted him above all else for good reason. Because he is worthy. He is the firstborn. All things are in him and by him and through him. And we give you, Jesus, all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And we say, worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Worthy is your name, Jesus. In this house, this morning, in my heart, in this community, in this city, we lift up the name Jesus. Lift him up this morning with me. Jesus, we give you praise. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy, Jesus. We give you all the praise. You are worthy. You are worthy in this place. Just sing it one more time, Tracy. Sing it one more time. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus. We're so grateful. Mm. Yeah. Fill this room, God, with your presence. We're so grateful for who you are. We just want to encounter you and be transformed by your goodness this morning. Fill this room up. If you would, me just... Uh, we're just going to pray for the kids. They were joined us for worship this morning. They're going to start taking part with us. Just a quick prayer. Holy Spirit, would you fill our children up? Would you fill them up with your wisdom, with your revelation? And let this be a, a special touch this morning, Father's Day, that the Father, the Father's hand would be felt upon their lives this morning. And we bless them. We invest in them as a community. We believe in them as our as our next generation, as the legacy of this place. 
And God, would you raise them up according to your standards, according to your goodwill? Would you agree with me? Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. You guys are going to keep playing. Thank you so much for leading us in worship. Wasn't that good this morning? Wow. I'm going to invite you to take your seat if you'd like. We're going to take a quick offering. We've got a lot to do this morning. Very excited about it. If you need an, if you need an envelope, you can raise your hand. If, ushers, if you want to come on up and keep your hand up if you need a, a, an envelope. Uh, Psalm 145, verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and His mercy is over all that He has made. My heart, honestly, for this community and for the body of Christ in general is that we would be able to, to, to be intentional about emulating who God is in our lives. And there's, there's a few things. I have a great relationship with my father. Um, he, he's just such a godly man. He was, um, I was raised on the mission field. They're still down there serving faithfully. And there's a few things in my life that I can say I, I learned directly from my dad. And that's his work ethic. He's a man of his word. You know, he's like, you know, don't um, say what you mean and, and mean what you say kind of guy. And he was a farm boy, grew up working hard his whole life, and he's working hard for the kingdom. And there's certain things that I've been able to do in my life that, that I can just directly tie into. It's just because he set that example over my life. And I just picked it up, and I emulated it, and it was easy for me to just kind of follow and, and step with that. And so my heart for us as believers is that our lives, our daily lives, would be an emulation. We emulate who the Father is and who Jesus is. And there's a lot of reasons that churches will encourage you to give for. That's my son, Sammy. He's, he's loud. He's got some strong lungs. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why there's a lot of good ways of taking offerings and a lot of bad ways of taking offerings. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a real bad way of an offering taken and you're just like, great, we're taking an offering now. How, the, how are they going to hit us up? Um, and I just, I hate that, that feeling Honestly, when I first started pastoring, I hated coming up and taking an offering because I was like, man, I grew up in church. I've heard so many things said just wrong, the manipulation, like different things. And I felt God challenge me to say, yeah, but don't you want my people to be able to enter into my blessing? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, when we do certain things, we make ourselves available to his blessing, like forgiveness. I love that analogy. We, we forgive others. Not necessarily for them, but because it opens our heart up for God's blessing to flow through our lives and bring healing, right? In the same way, when we give, it, it, it like elevates us to a different plane. Like we operate in the natural here, budgets, checkbooks in and out. And when we, we, we blow past that and give when we probably even shouldn't because we should be real careful with our budget and everything. But when we step out of the realm of what's normal and just go into the supernatural because he's a supernatural giver, we're available to his blessing in a significant way. And I just like to reiterate that we don't give to get. We give because God is good, and we want to be like our daddy, right? We want to be like our father in everything we do. It's why we pray for healing. It's why we go and minister to the poor. It's why we do what we do is because he did it first, and, and he set that example for us. So I just want to encourage you. God's goodness is over everything. The Bible is so clear about that. And in Exodus, when he had his glory pass before Moses, what was it? He said, I have, I've, I've made all my goodness pass before him. So the goodness of God is his glory. Don't you want to participate in that glory of God coming to earth, right? And so I just, I just want us to step out of the regular mindset and just say, you know what? We give because it's his goodness over our lives that we get to respond to in that. And that's it. It's very simple. We give because he's good, not for any other reason. And um, God is not a vending machine where you make, you know, you put in the top and you pull out from the bottom, like, it just doesn't work that way. It does work that way, but that's not why. It's just because he's so good over our lives. Amen. Anyways, I'm talking too much about it. Let's just, uh, let's just pray for the offering and just give it up to the Lord. Thank you, God, for this hard-earned cash, this dough that we want to put back your way. Have your way with it, God. Would you, just in this, just this, this paper, this check, whatever it is, this simple little, little arrangement of molecules and atoms, somehow this turns into lives being transformed through your spirit because you're so good at taking what we give and turn it into kingdom and turn it into building 
your kingdom. And I just want to encourage you to continue to pray for the leadership of the church, decision-making with finances, with everything you give. We want to be very responsible with that and try to be as effective as possible in affecting the lives of this community and those around us. So go ahead and uh, pass the baskets, please, ushers, and we'll just uh, keep on moving on. A little, a little fun business to take care of. Um, the biggest thing we have on our horizon is that next week, June 22nd, after the service at 1245 in the library, which is where the kids meet, we're having uh, our, our first um, new kids um, informational get involved meeting, right? And it's, a, it's just a place for anybody who has a heart for kids or just wants to hear what the community is, what we're building for the children's department. I want you to invite you to come back. Just take part. It's going to be a short meeting, you know, 20, 25 minutes of your time. Come and find out what's happening with the kids. The kids are such an essential part of, of the livelihood of this community in terms of our ability for God's blessing to be poured out in this community. And we just want to encourage you to come back there. We've got a lot of exciting things. We've had a lot of input from other leaders, a lot of curriculum. And we want you to be a part of building what we're doing as a community. Uh, we, we want parents to have a voice into what we're doing with the kids, and that's a perfect opportunity for you to come and at least get connected, and we're, we're going to have a time for your feedback, and we can talk about it. And um, uh, Do we have any uh, first comers this Sunday? We just want to say hi to you. All right, lots of you. All right, keep your hands up real quick. We've got some packets for you. We may need a few more. I, I'm told to let you know that if you fill out the little guest card and turn it in, you get a Starbucks gift card, right? So it's all you got to do is turn a little piece of paper and get yourself a coffee. That's a pretty good deal. Um, so just keep your hands up. If you haven't gotten one, we'll, we'll get you one. It's a little, little information card. We just want to get to know you, find out what you're interested in, find out what you love to do, and, uh, and see how we can get you plugged in. Um, all right, without any further ado, I'd like to invite our, our senior rabbinical leader in this house, pastor, preacher, prophet to the nations. No, he, now, just extend your hands real quick. Let's pray. Jason, we love you so much in this house, and we open our hearts to you this morning. Holy Spirit, would you fill him with your words, with your heart this morning, carrying such an amazing message. And God, I just pray that you would just release the Father's heart in this room through Jason. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. you. I want to encourage you parents, or even if you have a heart for children, to come out to the children's meeting. It's going to be key. Circle Sight just released their new album, so go check it out. Exciting. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. Why don't you, if there's a father next to you, just wish them a happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Leaves me hanging. Leaves me hanging. And a special Father's Day to my dad, who's over there with us this morning. These are some things that some famous people had to say about fatherhood. Bill Cosby, come on, I grew up with the Cosby Show. A new father quickly learns his child invariably comes to the bathroom at precisely the time he's in there as if he needed company. <laughs> Chris Rock. When I hear people talk about juggling or the sacrifices they made for the children, I look at them like they're crazy. Sacrifice infers that there's something better to do than being with your children. <laughs> Go, Chris. I love Ray Romano. Having children is like living in a frat house. Nobody sleeps, everything's broken, and there's a lot of puking. <laughs> We've got so many broken things in my house, I don't even know. We need a full-time handyman. <laughs> Jesus was a carpenter, but I'm not. All right. Having a kid is like, this is uh, Mike Myers. Having a kid is like falling in love for the first time when you're 12, but like every day. John Stewart. Fatherhood is great because you can ruin someone from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Twain said, uh, when I was 14, I thought my dad was really stupid. When I was 21, I realized how smart he was, and I said, man, he sure has grown a lot in seven years. <laughs> it's 
small boy once said, Father's Day is a lot like Mother's Day, except you don't have to spend as much on the present. <laughs> Father's Day is different. We can laugh, but there's some things that are not funny. There's 24 million American sons and daughters that are growing up without a father. In 2013, there was a book entitled, entitled Fathers in Cultural Context from Joshua Plecht of the University of Illinois writes, the notion, the notion that fathering is essential to children's social and personality development seems to be a uniquely American preoccupation. Current research, research actually provides little support for this popular conception of paternal essentiality. Pamela Paul, in an issue of the Atlantic Monthly, said the bad news is that the, for, the bad news for dad is that despite the common perception, there's nothing objectively essential about his contribution. The good news is that we've gotten used to him. In the book Raising Boys Without Men, Cornell psychologist Peggy Drexler put it this way, women possess the innate mom power that in and of itself is more than sufficient to raise fine sons and daughters. You know, the reality is, is that you, you, go, you, go to, you get well educated. I don't know what happens sometimes. But, uh, but the reality is, is if that was true, there was a perfect way for God to show that because Miriam or Mary didn't have any help of a man and yet God knew that she needed a husband to raise her son, even though he was the son of God. And so we see that in 50 years, we've gone from father knows best to father knows nothing to father is not even necessary in the minds of a lot of popular culture. And there's been, in a sense, a dissing of dad. But what I want to say is that fathers are key. And how do you break this spirit? You come in the opposite spirit with a spirit of encouragement on this father's day father's day just doesn't celebrate biological paternal fathers but it celebrates the importance of the institution of fatherhood in general and there's lots of haters out there who are not only dissing dad but are really damaging the concept of fatherhood and there's real consequences for our families and for our nation the disintegration of the importance of dad. And the interesting thing about all these individuals that we talked about last week is that they're coming at the idea of fatherhood and relationship from a contractual perspective and not a covenantal one. It's all about dad doesn't do a good enough job. He's not emotionally connected. He's not a good enough provider. But those are all contractual ways to define relationships and not covenantal ways, the way God defines relationship in Scripture. And the institution of marriage is essential for a healthy nation and a healthy society. And transformation is what we are about here, uniting to ignite transformation by following Jesus through loving, learning, caring, and sharing. And we want to see transformation occur in individuals' life, in the life of families. We want to see it happen in this city, in this region, in this country, and around the world on every single level. We believe God wants to bring transformation. But we have to come in that opposite spirit. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians. Submit to one another out of reverence for Messiah. And he goes on to say in verse 32, Ephesians 5, this is a profound mystery I'm talking about, Messiah and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and a wife must respect her husband. Let a wife see that she respects her. Her husband, or another translation. So again, I say a man must love his wife as part of himself, and the wife must see, see to it that she deeply respects her husband, praising and honoring him. You know, the truth is I feel a little bit of pressure today in giving this Father's Day message, because when I gave the Mother's Day message, I talked about the responsibility of men to love and respect their wives, and I got all the cheering from the women. When, you know, when I said husbands need to listen to their wives and be attentive and, 
and I said, you know, you got you to gotta be engaged with raising the children and do chores because doing chores are sexy. Man in an apron is hot. And I said things like, you got to, you got to, uh, you know, it says in Jewish thought that a man is supposed to honor his wife by making sure she's dressed nicely and spend more money on her clothing than on himself. And the guys were like, man, what's he going to do for us? Come on. There's some pressure here. But we desperately need transformation. And I want to talk today, the, 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 the coming in the opposite message, to strengthen our families, we need women, we need sons and daughters, we need wives that really are committed to loving and respecting and honoring their husbands. And the truth of the matter is, why is this so important for the transformation of our families and our societies? Because we were created to be in relationship, as we talked about last week. It says, it is not good for man to be alone. And at the very foundation of creation, there was unity in community in the first cause. God was three, yet one. And he created us, God created us and perpetually existed in a state of relationship. We were created to be in relationship and that's why it's not good for us to be alone. God was never alone and we're never to be alone and we're called to model just what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit shared in eternity to this day. We're called to model that. Iron sharpens iron and, and it says let us make man in our image. Therefore, community is the first cause of creation, and it's the way through relationship that God radically transforms us. You will never be transformed apart from other people that God brings into your life. You can't be transformed by yourself. As we said, relationships are like sandpaper for the soul. They smooth out the rough edges. You'll never grow in spiritual maturity until you live in the context of serious, intimate relationships. Because relationships are like mirrors. They're a reflection of ourselves. And so I want to explore how wives and children can love and honor their fathers with their heart, with their heads, with their hands, and with their feet. First and foremost, children must love their fathers and their first and foremost, children must love their fathers and wives must love their husbands from the heart. And so many of you are like, duh, of course I should love my mom and dad from my heart. Of course I should love my husband from my heart. But the truth of the matter is that the sometimes the greatest distance to bridge is the distance between here and here. It's easy to love the idea of love, and it's easy to love someone intellectually the, because, because it doesn't really risk anything for us. Having to open up your heart and let somebody in is a risky business. And what it means to love from the heart means to love intimately. But how do we practically and relationally begin to love from the heart, from the very start. And I think first and foremost for wives, it's essential that you love your husbands first. And it's hard sometimes to love your husbands first. Sometimes we don't make it easy to love us first. Because we mess up sometimes. But it's essential for wives to love their husbands more than they love their children. And it's hard because... Kids are so darn cute. I mean, you look at them, you're like, ah. Oh. But they're also really demanding. <laughs> it's like when my kids want something, forget it. Nothing's getting done until they, they get what they need. I mean, they're like the, the, the perfect parable, the person seek, ask, knock. No, 10 times. And so it's easy to get distracted. But when we look at the very order of creation, God creates man, then he creates woman, and together they give birth to children. The relationship of the husband and wife is the foundation of the family, and it has to be guarded. This is the whole structure of Ephesians 5. 
And it's a huge responsibility to care for a life of another. So therefore, it's easy to put kids who are so dependent upon us first. How many of you guys ever saw that sitcom from back in the day called Dinosaurs? There was a, and there was a little baby dinosaur. Whenever the father would come, the baby would go, not to mama, not to mama, not to mama. <laughs> There's certain things I can't do. I can't breastfeed my baby. So they make those man boobs. We're not even going to go there. That's pretty scary. It's a scary thought. Some things are just not natural. But women have to make sure that the husbands don't get the leftovers. That the primary love is for a wife, is for her husband. That is the foundation to make sure that she delights in him even more than she delights in her children. To make sure that there is special time that is carved out. And to make sure that we model this for our kids. And this might be one of the greatest gifts that we ever give to our children. Is for a wife, a woman to model her love and respect and the priority of her husband as first place in her life. And for the father to do the same for his, for his wife. Because our kids are going to think what is normal is what they see. And the reality of the case is that it's one of the greatest gifts because they need to know that mom loves dad first. And that dad loves mom first. There is a sense of security and well-being that that creates within the context of the family. And they need to know this so that one day when they get married and have a family, they'll know, man, when I wanted it, mom told me to wait. I'm talking to dad. When I wanted mommy's affection, because, you know, my, my, especially my boys love Stephanie. And my son Judah, you know, in the past, he'd get jealous when he'd see us snuggling in bed. He'd jump right in the middle because he wanted the loveys. But they need to know. What's mom and dad's first commitment? The media is not doing a good job of modeling it. We need to model it. And the truth of the matter is the sad thing is that so many times what I see is, and it's so easy to do, is that, that families, that husband and wives have kids and they fall in love because there's nothing better than being a mom. And dad is such a joy. But what happens is they spend so much time getting focused on the children that they forget to invest in each other. And then one day the kids grow up and they move out and mom and dad realize there's no point of connection anymore. What do they have in common? They haven't cultivated the intimacy or the interest that they share together and what you sow and is what we reap. And the same is true for kids as well. We need to make sure we make time for our dad. Everybody knows that mom needs love, but dad needs a little TLC too. Come on, you can watch the Kings game together. Go Kings. I will say it was a little tough. I grew up in New York, but I rooted for the Kings. Have breakfast together. Make a breakfast appointment. Do something fun together. Let your dad know how much you love him. And children and wives should also love and honor their dads, their spouses verbally because the heart is connected to the mouth because it's out of the overflow of the mouth that the what? The heart speaks. So the way we know what is in our heart, the reflection of our heart is through our mouth. It's so important that we tell him how important he is to us, how much we not only love him, but we like him. You can love someone, but not like them. And guys need to know, we need to know we're loved and we're liked, that you really want to be with us, because sometimes we can get a little insecure too. Focus on what he's doing right instead of focusing on the negatives. You know, Keep the com you know, when he comes home at night, you know, give him a minute to rewind from that crazy day at work. And sometimes it's good to be brief. <laughs> sometimes the greatest thing is silence. <laughs> Just to be able to sit there and enjoy a moment together. Sometimes nothing needs to be said. Sometimes we don't need to fill that space with stuff. Because guys are usually a little less verbal. So just chill with them. Find some shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder activities that you guys like doing just to be with the other person. 
cheer his success, whether in business or in every, every other areas of life. And it's really important that we don't max ourselves out and overcommit ourselves so we don't have any emotional space. Can't live maxed out. And just thank him for being himself. Send an email saying, praying for you today. Send a text saying, I believe in you. Just remember that. I believe in you. You know, to, to encourage means to give courage. And one of the biggest things I encourage you not to do is let's not nag. <laughs> Nagging is a life sucker. I mean, there is a time to correct your man. But, you know, make that time together, to, to make that time to sit down and talk to him, not just, you know, just set a time. Man, it's important to honor him, to let him hear you speaking well of him to your girlfriends, to your children, and especially to your mom. And never let anyone talk disrespectfully about him, stand up for him, and do the same if you're a kid for your parents. And wives, leave him romantic notes. Let him know you love him. And I think one of the greatest things you can do is create an environment of love and laughter and of joy and of joking because there's nothing that connects our hearts better than to laugh together. And such a laughter is such a powerful thing. Those are some practical aspects. There's also a spiritual aspect of loving from the heart. Because here at Ascend, we say loving, learning, caring, sharing. Loving is about the heart. First and foremost, it's loving about the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. If you're going to be a great kid or you're going to be a great wife, the first thing you need to do is not put your husband first, is to put God first. We got to have the priority straight. The first responsibility of a woman or of a child is to be a godly woman, number one, to be a godly wife, number two, to be a godly mother, number three, and to be a godly friend, number four. When we do the reverse, we fall into idolatry. And too many times, we prefer to speak to our friends over taking our problems to the Lord. When we get frustrated with our loved one, it's much easier to call up our friends, you know what my husband just did, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> and sometimes guys do that too. But before we share the problems that we have with our spouse, we need to first bring those problems to the Lord. Because most of the times, our friends can't help us solve for it. But the Lord has the answers. It's not wrong to have a confidant, but you, but you need to make sure who that confidant is and that it's not going to hurt or dishonor the ones that you love. And too often, we'd rather speak with our friends as well rather than our husbands. You can never be a great wife or a great child, a great son or daughter, until you put God first. As I share with you before, I love it when my boys say, Daddy, we really love you so much, but we love God more than you. Is there anything better to hear than that? And we think about the heart, it's about loving God, and loving God is about worship and prayer. One of the greatest encouragements is to know that your spouse is praying for you especially in difficult times. There is power in a praying wife. There is power in a worshiping wife. And one of the things, if we're going to have powerful households, they're going to shape children. They're going to shape our family. I think we have to have houses that are filled with worship and prayer. It's just great to put on worship music in the house. God, we call it God music in our house. Put on God music in the car and let that permeate the atmosphere and create a spirit of positivity. So we love from our hearts, first and foremost. The heart of the matter is always the heart. But number two, we're called to love from our heads. Love and honor must come from the heart to be real, but they begin. In, but honor and respect begins in the head, not the heart. Because let's be honest, what we think about a person is often how we see them. What we think about a person determines how we react and respond to them. If we create these files in our minds about negative things about a person, those files once created, we begin to see, we begin to see them through those negative files. And it's hard to respond from a place of honor. And there's nothing more important 
for a great marriage than how you view your husband or if you're a child, how you view your parents because there's a basic principle Danny Silk talks about is life flows through honor. Life flows through honor. This, and the, word, the same word in Hebrew for honor, kavod, is the same word for wealth. It's the same word for honor. It's the same word for weighty. And to treat someone with honor is treating them as if they are weighty, as if they matter. To dishonor is to treat them like they have no value. It's to, and so every man wants to be loved and respected. I, when I, you know, one of my favorite movies growing up was A Bronx Tale. How many of you guys seen that? That's a classic Bronx Tale. And there's one scene when, when, he's, when he's with his mafioso, when the young kid's with his mafioso mentor, and he's like, hey, forget about it. You know what I'm talking about, huh? Eh? And because uh, I grew up with some of those guys. And he says to his mentor, he says, would you rather be loved or respected? It might be feared. And he says, I would like to be both, ideally. He said, but if I had to choose, I'd rather be respected or feared. And for a lot of guys, honor and respect is so important to who they are as men and to manhood. And every man wants to be respect and honored as well as love. And one of the greatest gifts a wife or a child can give, his, can give their husband or to give their father is to see the hero in their spouse or in their dad. Man, guys love action movies. Why? We want to be the hero. We want the S on our chest. We want to be Spider-Man. We want to be the guy that comes in and saves the day, the riding the white horse. We want to be heroes. Man, I love it. My kids are five, seven. I'm the hero. Daddy can do anything. I want my family to look at me like that. Even though I can't, I want them to believe that I can because I will try my best. Every guy wants to be a hero. We need wives, children, make him a hero in your mind. If he's not a hero and he's got more villain qualities, <laughs> maybe more, more Lex Luthor than Superman, then find the few good things in them and focus. Listen, the power of a woman, the power of a praying wife is the ability to call things that are not as if they were. To shape, to bring forth the best. And sometimes we need others to see things that we can't see in ourselves. Because oftentimes we're the last people to see them. We're the last people to believe them. And many husbands and dads feel unworthy. Sometimes they don't feel like they can provide, that they're not as gifted as moms or as necessary as we heard earlier. But let your dad know, let your husband know, he's your hero. You know, I think next year we're going to make all the guys a cape for Father's Day and have them running around. I thought about it too late. Bring your cape for Father's Day. The kids, can be, we're going to have a cape, make your own cape table. We can bling it out for the dads. Or maybe we need to have superhero shirts with a big D in the middle. Man, I want to be a hero. I want, I want my family to think I'm one. And when you begin to look at someone through that perspective, it begins to change them. And oftentimes people rise to the level of expectation. If you expect little from someone, oftentimes they're going to meet your expectations and give you little. It's like that kid that gets labeled as a troublemaker or dumb or, you know, at school, and then all that he begins to believe those lies, and he becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Speak something different. See something different. And some of you might be, some of you might be single, and you're like, man, what does this have to do with me? And, and, you know, and I don't have a father anymore because he might have passed. But let me tell you something. You prepare now for what you believe the promise is. You don't wait to get there. The preparation begins beforehand. You don't wait for your ship to come in to unload it. You begin to pray and make sure you can when it does. And so you become this sort of person you become this sort of person, you purpose that in your heart, and then you will be prepared, and you will have people, there's going to be someone out there that wants to love you because they see this in you. 
Every guy wants that. And respect starts in the head, and it includes our minds and our thoughts. And disrespect also starts in the head and can affect our hearts and our hands over time. James 1.14 describes this perfectly. But each one of you is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Disrespect starts when we think things like, man, that was a dumb decision, and I I can do better than that, or I wish he was more like this, or I'll just fix the things he does wrong, or I hope the kids don't grow up to be like him, and when he's out of town, life will be a lot easier, and I won't ask him because he won't understand, and you look at him when you ask him to do something like he's incompetent, and that's not the way to roll. Slow the roll. Change the thinking. The mind, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be what? transformed by the renewing of your mind if you want a renewed relationship you need a renewed mind and a new renewed perspective on the people and the men in your life instead of look even if people have issues and problems and are doing things wrong you have a level of responsibility as well you can't change them but you can change the way you respond you can change the way you think about them you can change the way you interact with them And sometimes we just need to repent and ask God to forgive us and to change our minds and our hearts by the way we look at our fathers or by the way we look at our husbands and their failures. For others, you understand this, but it's difficult to do it. So we need to ask God to empower us and listen to the Spirit to help us and begin to develop habits of biblical thinking that we're thankful for the gift of our fathers and for the gifts of our husbands. And the head is about knowing. As we've said before, you can't love someone who you don't know. So part of knowing is how well do you know your husband? How well do you know what he likes and what he dislikes, his hobbies, what he's passionate about? Engage him intelligently and passionately about topics he's interested in, whether it's sports, politics, or faith, or all the above. And kids, we need to do the same. We need to, you know, one of the things a good father does is he makes the interest of his kids his interest. Man, I've learned a lot about Skylanders. I've learned a lot about Power Rangers. I've learned a lot about Lego Star Wars. That I, I'm not interested in this stuff, but my kids are. And if I want to love them and be in relationship with them, i got to love some of the things that they love. And I want to be excited about the things they're excited about because they excite me. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, that's exactly what my dad did. I wanted to be a ninja. So my dad took me to the special ninja karate store in Philadelphia. And he would drive anywhere. And then I got into BMX biking. And he drove me two states away because there was the best BMX bike store. Because, of course, it's the best because I got the biggest ma- magazine ad in the back of BMX magazine. <laughs> and then I wanted to be a DJ. And so my dad went out and researched DJ equipment and found great DJ stuff. And then I became a DJ. I'll rap for you sometime. And I see it with Stephanie, who's a great wife and mom. I mean, Steph, I never thought I'd see the day when my wife would knit. She's become an amazing knitter because they knit at school. All the parents knit. The kids learn how to knit at their school. And so she's become a knitting mom. I call my boys the knitwits because <laughs> they enjoy knitting. But we become, But part of what it means to love someone is to love what they love. There's no perfect wife, but I thank God for mine. There's no perfect husband, but hopefully you thank God for yours. So observe your dad. Observe your husband. Make a journal. Make a list of the things you appreciate about him. And one of the greatest ways to honor him with your head besides getting to really know his heart is to seek his advice. One of the ways you honor him is recognizing dad's not so dumb. He's actually pretty smart. And he's got some wisdom. And I love when my kids come to me for advice. Daddy, what do you think about this? What do you think I should do? 
Oh, I love it. And knowing is about the head, but it's also about, spiritually speaking, it's about knowing God's word. If we don't know the word, if we don't know the Bible, if we don't know the scripture, none of us will ever be the type of, type of spouses, the type of children that God wants us to be. Allow and encourage your husband to be the spiritual leader in your home. Husbands need your encouragement. They need you to make them the hero and know that you believe in them. But also we need hands of love and honor. The hands are about servants. The type of leaders that God calls us to be are not authoritarian leaders that lord it over. We're called to be servant leaders. And Messiah said, the greatest among you will be a what? Servant. If you want to be a good, if you want to learn to fill the commandment, honor your mother and father, it's one of the only commandments that has a direct promise to it of blessing that you might live a long life. Honor your mother and your father. Part of what it means to honor our mother and father is to learn what it means to serve them. To become servant leaders. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper, a companion. So God formed from the dirt of the ground all the animals, and he brought them to Adam. And man found no suitable companion. But God put man into a deep sleep. And as he slept, he removed one of his ribs and placed it with, and replaced it with flesh. And God then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make the woman and presented her to man. Man, you come from our ribs. We're called to be one. We're missing without one another. In Hebrew, the name for the woman is an ezer kenegdo, a helper beside, commonly translated a helpmate. And some of you will be like, what do you mean I'm his helpmate? But let me tell you the word ezer. Can you say ezer? The ezer is a compliment. Why? That is the same word God uses to describe himself. God is called the Ezer. Psalm 10, 14. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. To the helpless, the helpless commits himself to you, and you are the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 118, 6 and 7. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Psalm 118, verse 6 and 7, the Lord is by my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The same verse. Well, it's the same verse. <laughs> the Lord is my helper. To bear one another burdens, to find practical ways to be the hands. The hands are about service. And one of the things guys need your hands for is they need your hands to hug them and to hold them and to love them. You know, when it comes to my kids, let me tell you what, this morning, my boys jumped in the bed, and they were just hugging on me and giving me loveies, and I was like, oh, God, this is the best. Until I found out they wanted my iPhone. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Little truth to that. <laughs> but mostly loveies. <laughs> but I want to be hugged by my kids. I want to be hugged by my wife. I need affection. Men need affection. Men are very tactile. We need to be touched. We need that platonic love, and then we need that romantic love. We need that romantic intimacy. We need our wives to initiate sometimes. Hands that touch. Man, we need that. We need your love. It's also, you know, not just hands that touch, but hands that feed. They say the quickest way to the man's heart is through his stomach. And there's truth in that. Practical. Keep a dream journal together. Use your hands to write. I mean, one of the great things I want to do, I haven't done it yet, is to keep a dream journal. All the places you want to go together. All the things you want to accomplish together. Get some brochures. Write some things down. Begin to dream. You know, the couple that dreams together, the family that, that dreams together will stay together and pray together. And then celebrate it when those dreams come into reality. 
Man, there's no way better to honor someone to help serve their dreams and see them come to pass. And the truth is God won't send someone to serve your dreams until you serve other people's. And why not start with your family? But I think there's another part to this too, which is as a wife, don't just give up on your dreams from the sake of serving the dreams of your family as well. Don't put those dreams. Look, let me tell you, there's nothing more inspiring than an inspired wife. Than a wife who is excited and passionate about her, the God dreams that she's been given. Nancy Alcorn, the author, was having a discussion with Dr. Julie Slattery, and this is what she said. She said, I think a lot of the reason for it is because God created man in such a way that he really needs a good woman to bring out the hero in him. God has equipped a woman with the skills and the intuition, if she understands it right, to help her husband develop into a strong leader, to help him become a confident man, to help him with his deep need for confidence and respect. A lot of people don't understand this. So instead of helping develop their man, they are, they are married to. All they can do is lament that he's not the kind of guy they wanted to be married to. So they end up using the power that could build him instead to break him down. Nancy, I would say the word of, uh, say concerning the word of God. I met it on Philippians 4, 8 to help me with this. It says we are to dwell on the things that are, our minds are to dwell on the things that are good and lovely. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Dwell on the good things in your kids and in your spouse and your fathers. I have been frustrated with not feeling appreciated, she said, by my husband. And that he didn't read his Bible like he once did. That he wasn't the spiritual leader in the house like he once was. But, it, but two weeks, I was challenged. And two weeks into the challenge, my husband started to come to me. I don't deserve having a wife like you. You do so much for me. Most of the days, I deserve you to punch me. And you just love me instead. She goes on to say, I noticed a huge increase in him reading the scriptures and him helping me around the house without asking. Now I believe that complimenting rather than complaining is the best way for the wife to impact her husband. And I hope I always remember this. To encourage is to give courage. What if we encourage one another to be who God has created us to be? I want to close where we began. Do we need both do we really need biological? Do we really need spiritual fathers? I don't know about you, but growing up, I loved the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. How many of you guys remember Will Smith, Fresh Prince, you know? Come on, now I'm living out here from Jersey. In the 1994 episode, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air, it shows a young Will Smith in a scene that are real to many American boys. Will's father promised to take him on the trip, and guess what? He was a no show. This is what Will says. He says, he shouts, I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. And I'm going to marry a beautiful honey and have a whole bunch of kids without him. And I'm going to be a better father than he ever was. And then he chokes up and says, how come he don't want me, man? Every child needs the affirmation of a father. They need the love of a father, and they need the love of a mother, and it doesn't have to be a biological father. It can be a spiritual father's, and every one of us as men, there is a challenge to us is to be that sort of father because Father's Day is not just about celebrating biological father's. It's about fatherhood. And you don't have to be, have kids to be a true father or to be a true mother. There are so many kids out there, both young and older, that have never had a father, someone to speak into their lives, that have never had a, a fatherly figure bless them, and their heart yearns for that, and we have a responsibility to be that. It's not the welfare system, it's not the government, it's not the media, it's not the schools, it is our responsibility as spiritual men to be the fathers that are missing in this nation and in this society.
And that's the gauntlet that we lay down to be those fathers. But to step out and be those fathers, we can't do it without the women in our lives that are going to be the spiritual mothers partnering with us to be the women in our lives that encourage us and empower us and to believe in us that we could be that hero for our kids or for somebody else's kids who desperately need it. So Abba, right now, as we begin to close... We just wanted number one. We just want to, we just, we just want it. We just want a number one. We want to ask God for marriages in this place to be healed. Heal marriages. Heal strained relationships. Let there be mutual honor and respect on both sides. And we're asking Abba for people here that are hurt because their fathers were not there for them. Heal those fathers' wounds right now. Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's a prophetic promise. Turn the hearts of the wives to their husbands and the husbands to their wives that we might see our family healed, that we might see our children healed, that we might see our community and nation healed. For your name's sake, do that work now in Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we continue before we worship and do a special thing to honor fathers, we have a little video to play that we're going to show. The miracle of having kids and children in itself is a story that's long and beautiful. But I've had to pick one thing. I think it's watching your children become who they're going to be. Sort of getting an opportunity to just see them as they're being shaped as God leads them towards their destiny. Uh, what I love about being a father is uh, the time that I can spend with my kids. You know, time to me is the most important thing that I can give my kids. The gift of time allows them to have a relationship with me and me with them. And in that context of relationship, I can pass along my faith and they can develop their faith. Being a father gives you the opportunity to kind of do a bit of a do-over. We're raised by our parents and bless them, but they're not perfect. And uh, as a as a parent and a father, you get to uh, kind of redo some of the things that maybe weren't done right in your life. And, uh, and I just love the opportunity to make things right. Being a father means that you invest yourself, your time, your energy, your effort in your children for that next generation. Getting to get an opportunity to sit there and watch this person become who they are and hopefully having a positive, godly influence on that. I love being able to nurture the diversity of my kids, to, to, to identify the areas that they're unique um, and, and feed that and so that they can come into their, um, their uniqueness and their ultimate destiny and their divine destiny. I think the most important advice that I can give to anybody about being a parent or being a father is to take time to listen to your kids. Take time to watch them. Take time to be with them because, again, time is the most important thing. That's the one thing that we can never say. Balance within your life, within your career, um, so that you have the time to be with them. Have fun. Take trips. Um, sit down and talk with them. Have dinner together around the table. Turn off the cell phones and, uh, and, and just be together. You follow God and what he says and what he shows in his word uh, through all the, the stories and examples and parables and just the love he shows through his son. Uh, if you follow those then you're on the right path. Oh, one word. <laughs> Investment. Beautiful. Blessing. Love. The biggest one is love. Words that mean gigantic. <laughs> wisdom. Pray for wisdom. My dad, he's always been there for me. Like, if I ever had a problem, I could always go to him and talk to him about it. And then he's always, like, he always thinks about those things and thinks it through. And he's very logical about stuff, so it's really helpful. He's... Like one of those rough and tough dads, like where when you play around, he's just like the silly kind of play around. I love his sense of humor and his spontaneousness. Is that a word? Spontaneity. 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 I don't know. <laughs> What's your favorite memory with your dad? When we go to Six Flags. Awesome. <laughs> when, we go, when we go on rides and then Reds, he goes, like, that was awesome. <laughs> Let's see it. That was awesome! <laughs> I don't believe it, man! So smooth! <laughs> my favorite memory, uh, when I was a kid, I used to go with my dad to rock climbing about once a week we'd go. 
and it was really cool. We'd spend about two hours rock climbing, and I would be the only one that would rock climb. He would always hold the rope for me. Um, but it just, it was really good because it really helped me to grow and become, I guess, independent, but also have him there, knowing that he was holding me, kind of. When we go up to Yosemite, uh, he, we would always go outside our cabin, and we would look up at the stars, and he would put on John Denver, and just, you know, that peace and listening to him and us all looking up at the stars together. One word, what would it be? He's very loving. And so I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't have is their father that holds them and loves them. Um, loving, caring. I would probably say unique in the best way possible. You know, very different from other fathers. Silly. What? Silly? <laughs> would help. Good morning. I think the battery's dead. Really? Is it on? Am I on? Okay, well, that means you heard. Am I on now? Yes? Okay. I don't think the battery's no, dead. No, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, ladies, let's be honest. How many of us are feeling a little bit convicted this morning? <laughs> don't tell me. Um, I would like to ask all of the men to stand up, whether you're a physical father in the natural right now, or uh, this feels a little weird. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> if everybody could stand up and if the ladies could stand up around the men and extend your hands over them. I found something on the internet that I just wanted to pray over everybody in the spirit of the, the many different kinds of fathers that there are. <sighs> just agree with me. Let us praise those fathers who have striven, to, have striven to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. Let us praise those fathers who, lacking a good model for a father, have worked to become a good father. Let us praise those fathers who, despite divorce, have remained in their children's lives. Let us praise those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support has offered healing. Let us praise those fathers who, as stepfathers, freely choose the obligation of fatherhood and earn their stepchildren's love and respect. Let us praise those fathers who have lost a child to death and continue to hold the child in their heart. Let us praise those men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. Let us praise those men who have fathered us in their role as mentors and guides. Let us praise those men who are about to become fathers. May they openly delight in their children. And let us praise those fathers who have died but live in our memory and, those and, and whose love continues to nurture us. Lord, we just thank you for all of the men in this room, Father. And we just thank you for the example of who you are, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that you would just empower these men, pour strength, pour love, pour guidance, pour discernment into them to truly balance the, the, the stress sometimes of work and life and providing for their families um, with the love and the time that their families so desperately need, Lord. And so, Lord, we just pray for these men today, Lord, and for the men in this room who maybe have hurts in their hearts, whose own fathers have not done right by them, or for the men who have guilt in their own hearts for maybe not living up to everything they've wanted to as a father, Lord. We just pray that you would um, give back the years of lo that the locusts have eaten, Father. And we just pray today, Lord, that you, together as a community, would strengthen our families, Lord. We just lift all of the men up. Just give them an extra dose of supernatural joy and love and grace today, Lord. We just lift them up in B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're a guy, just remain standing, and we got a gift for you. Happy, happy Father's Day. Just saying, we spent as much on the guys as the women here. <laughs> 
Guys, don't be going home and be like, did you hear what Jason said? <laughs> Let's love one another and serve one another. We just invite the ministry team to come forward. We're going to close in a song. If there's a guy around you, just give him a hug and just say, God has created you to be a hero. God has created you to be a hero. All right, guys, let's stand up. We're worshiping one more song. We'll have the ministry team on the side if you need prayer especially for hurts relating to family, fathers, marriages. And there's a outside hospitality tables to socialize. So let's, uh, let's go out with a bang. Let's sing a song. Let's praise God.
Mother's Day. Have a great day. Prayer team, have a great time. Give someone a hug and tell them you love them. Woo!